With the time now arriving to discuss the final of the three cars in GT7's 1.19 July update, uh, an update which I've, as well as some other updates as well, been referring to as GT Sport updates occasionally in videos, mostly because I guess my subconscious keeps thinking of this game as GT Sport because it's so similar in some unfortunate ways, especially when it comes to updates. This, for me and for those who share my fandom of Maserati, is a pretty significant car. Not because it's necessarily one of my favourite Maseratis, in fact I certainly wouldn't say it's one of my absolute favourites, not that I dislike it, but for those who are a fan of the brand, it's not exactly like we had a huge amount to choose from. Now, for me personally, and I'm sure for any other Maserati fan, pretty much, the number one would probably be the MC12, either in road or racing form, to see debut in the series. Maybe the MC20, now that that one's out, but for me the MC12 easily surpasses that one. This, though, goes to Maserati's heritage. And the interesting thing about Maserati is, for those who maybe aren't super fans of the mark, it tends to be the classic and vintage stuff which gets more respect. A lot of their road cars in particular, modern stuff especially, and when I say modern I'm talking anywhere in the last 30-40 years even, it doesn't tend to have the best reputation when it comes to reliability. And again, I speak from personal experience, having owned two of them and one of them certainly didn't go that well, as some of you who've been around on the channel for a while will know. Now with that in mind, this particular model is a 1954 Maserati, so proper old school racing stuff. It's a front engine rear wheel drive car, and it is of course the A6 GCS. Now the car has, unsurprisingly, a fairly low performance point level, at least compared to the other cars. The curious thing is though, it's actually not as low as you might expect from a car that's only got 166 horsepower, because even on comfort tyres, which of course is what I'm using here in the video, it sits at 502 points. That's actually not bad when you think about it, and the weight of course being low helps with that. 740 kilos is not very much at all, and of course not uncommon for the time. Race cars were typically smaller, there's not really that much to them, and as I mentioned again in my overarching review of this update, it has the, what I like to call, bathtub approach to driving a car. It feels like an about as basic of a race car as you can get. It's just a set of wheels, an engine and a seat on top, with barely a body. And that sometimes allows for a pretty great driving experience. Because for all of the fantastic innovations of modern cars, be it experimental stuff like CVTs, turbines, hybrids, whatever, or even if you go to a, a pure modern car like a, a Group C or a GT1, these cars, for all of their prowess, sometimes, and I would say especially now, this is more so than ever before with hybrids and electric technology and that kind of thing, they don't necessarily have as much of the fun factor to race them. They're still fun to watch, but there's just something about an older car, even as far back as in the 50s, seeing these drivers throw these cars, with still in some cases some pretty serious power, on these skinny borderline bicycle tires over hills, on dangerous circuits like the Nordschleife or Spa, and just pushing these cars to the limits with roll bars that were lower than the driver's head, so I don't even know what they were supposed to do. Cars that had magnesium in their construction so they would literally catch fire on impact. It was just a dangerous time, and it was a car that you could, in real life at least, many of these cars, control with the throttle more than the steering wheel. The steering wheel kind of felt like just somewhere to put your hands on a car like this back then and you just got around corners with liberal application of either a fairly ineffective throttle or an even less effective brake pedal. And that is something which could make these awful to drive in a game. The great thing about this one though is, fandom or not, it's lovely to drive. It's actually really nicely balanced and as you'll see throughout my driving here at Spa, you can get the tail out, absolutely. But the fact that it doesn't actually have all that much power, for its time maybe, but definitely not now, and of course the weight being low, means it's not a handful by any stretch. Now when I took this car around Spa against, for example, my lap time in the aforementioned Aston Martin DB5 that I talked about in that same update review, it was seven seconds quicker than the Aston. Now of course this is a race car, that's a road car, but still, they're both running comfort tyres, they're both a similar kind of age, they are both, after all, high performance models, one a road car, one a race car, and the Aston has a pretty huge advantage, or at least it should, in terms of straight line performance due to its power and torque. 
and yet it was slower, because the Maserati, much like most race cars in any class with less power, means that, like I love to say, the less power you have, the more of it you can use. A principle which initially applies to motorcycles, but also applies to cars. If you've only got 150, 200 horses, you can wring every last horsepower out of the car and have so much fun with it. Now, in the case of this one, you know, long story short, it's absolutely not an essential purchase for the vast majority of Gran Turismo 7 players. It's no way near as exciting as the Skyline Super Silhouette. It's certainly not as fast, to the surprise of no one, as a, an admittedly broken but still very quick Porsche 918. But it's a glorious collector's piece, it's a lovely little canvas to work from, and it's a second Maserati to work with, which for those of us like me is just great in its own right. Hopefully, according to the data leaks, we may get another Maserati or two in future, so I'm looking, of course, forward to that. For now though, I will say that this, despite not being by any stretch an essential purchase, is nonetheless a lovely little car to have in your arsenal. And because it doesn't need that much power to go quick, it actually means it could potentially be quite good for modest performance point related events, especially online. You might go up against people who can't afford a car like this maybe, who haven't done enough grinding to buy the 2.9 million credit price tag, which at least at the moment is what it is at Haggerty's, and of course that could change, that's the whole point of the dealership. For now though, I love this thing. It's a lovely little car, it's not one of my favourite Maseratis as I said, and even so, it's still lovely to work with, regardless of the badge on the front. If you haven't tried it out yet, and if you can afford it, well unless you're specifically eyeing up something else to buy and you've got limited funds, if you can afford to waste potentially 3 million credits on anything in the game, you may as well buy something like this, try it out, and it certainly isn't a waste. I'm not going to say you'll use it all the time, but I think you will like it. It looks nice, sounds nice, it's certainly a pleasure to drive, and it could actually be more useful than you might think. But overall, that's it for my thoughts on the Maserati. Great to see a second trident-bearing classic, a beautiful one like this in the game. And of course, drop your thoughts down below. Have you bothered buying it? Do you love the car, hate the car? Were you disappointed by it? And are you as much of a Maserati nut as I am? <laughs> Tell me down below, of course, stick around for more on the channel. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.